the last couple of months, what we were looking at was the first year of the Lord Buddha's life, and then the last year of the Lord Buddha's life. Now, I just want to give you some perspective on this. If you remember, it's just around this area is where the main part of uh, Lord Buddha's teaching and life took place. Now we've moved right out. Just to give you some idea, from east to west is about 5,000 kilometers on this map. And from north to south, that's about 3,500 kilometers. So we're talking about a much bigger area. Because what we're going to do is take the time from after the Lord Buddha passed away up until Ashoka's time. And then in Ashoka's time, most of this area was actually part of the Ashokan Empire. But how it got there, we're going to talk about tonight, okay? So, Lord Buddha, one of the main areas that he was teaching in, and one of the most important areas at the time, was Magadha. That's this area here. He was born actually up here in the foothills of the Himalayas. Lumbini is around here. He attained awakening around here. And he gave his first discourse around here. And then he passed away around here. Okay, so it's this area that we're talking about. But this Magadha state was a very important state. It saw the rise of Buddhism. It also, though, saw the rise of Jainism. This is where... Mahavira was also teaching for the main part and also the Arjivikas. And this state was gaining in importance. If you remember last month when I was talking about Ajatasattu who had taken over the kingship of Magadha from his father Bimbisara. He had actually had his father put to death. And he took over as king about seven years before the Lord Buddha passed away. And then there was this discourse between the Buddha and Ajatasattu. Ajatasattu wanted to know about the Vajis. So he went to the Lord Buddha and then the Lord Buddha said, as long as the Vajis keep up their traditions and they keep this democratic society and they're not in a state of division, he will not be able to defeat them. Now sometime after Lord Buddha passed away, Ajatasattu put in Asian Provocateur into the Vajian Republic and he managed to break them up into groups so that they were no longer had this kind of democratic unity, were no longer meeting in unison and were no longer coming to unanimous decisions. And it was only then actually that he managed to overthrow them. So this is at the time of Lord Buddha. At the time of Lord Buddha, there were these 16, they're called Mahajanapadas. It means like great states or something like that. Gandhara, Cambodia, Kuru, Panchala, Macha, Kosala, uh, Surasena, Avanti, Asaka, Chaiti, Wansa, Kazi, Mala, Vajji, Anger, and Magadha. As I said last time, it was the monarchies that were on the rise and the, the republics were finding it difficult to sustain their republics against the centralized powers of the monarchies. So, Ajatasattu eventually managed to overthrow the Vajians, if you, if you look here, the Vajians and the Angas and Kazi here. And then he managed to overthrow the Vajians and he attacked Kosala. Now Kosala was also a monarchy. And he didn't manage to overthrow that monarchy. But there was a second part to Kosala, which was down here, which was Kazi. Sometimes in the early text, you see that Kazi is called Southern Kosala, Dakana Kosala, because Kosala and Kazi, these two states, were very closely aligned. It was a very dynamic period at that point, you know. 
the, 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 the whole political landscape was changing very quickly at that time. And there was a lot of development. You know, these cities were coming up. Like even now, if we go back, and some of these cities, like the capital of Kosala was Sarvati. But if we go dig down into the archaeological ruins, uh, we find that Sarvati was only founded in the 6th century. And the Lord Buddha was teaching not long after that. And just not long after that, it was already a major city in India. You know, it was where the Lord Buddha gave most of his teachings because it was such a big mercantile city, you see. Uh, but these cities had only recently, in historical times, they'd only recently been founded. So there, there was this dynamism in the political landscape in Lord Buddha's time and following Lord Buddha's time, as we will see as we go along. So... Now, Ajanta Satu moved out from Magadha. He managed to capture the Vajian lands and bring those under control. And then he also, he hadn't managed to de defeat the coastlands, but he had brought Kazi under his control as well. So he, that's quite an expansion of the area that was in control. This is still like the Magadan uh, state, but it's much increased. Now at that time also, or around that time, you know, somewhat before Lord Buddha passed away, the Sakians, which was his home tribe, his home people, had been defeated in a war and basically exterminated. Nearly the whole tribe was exterminated. There's just one family, that's Mahanama's family. Mahanama was a cousin of the Lord Buddha. And his lineage, for some political reason that was involved with this war, was allowed to go free. So they were the only ones that, that survived, and the, the rest were basically either destroyed or absorbed into the surrounding peoples. You know, the states were going out and then becoming bigger. And then, you know, the peoples that would have been here, you see, were basically losing their identities because they were being absorbed by these bigger states. So this was the expansion during Ajata Satu's time. If, if you remember, last time I was telling you, Ajata Satu killed Bimbisara, his father. But Ajata Satu's son killed Ajata Satu. And then his son killed him. And his son killed him. And his son killed him. And it went on for something like nine generations. And every time the son killing the father. And the people just got, you know, fed up with it and said, you know, this is just a family of patricides. And they don't want them anymore. And they overthrew them. And they introduced a new lineage. That lineage was actually the uh, Sisunaga lineage which lasted as far as we can tell from the historical records for about 80 years and it was during that time that the capital was moved from Rajagaha to Pataliputra which was on the Ganges and it led down into what is now Calcutta you see uh, but it means the port. It's actually probably Tamiliti. You see, all down here, you know, it's all you going out into the silk routes. You can do trading down here, you know, into Burma, into Thailand, into Malaysia, across the peninsula, into China. So this was an important trade route down here. And then following that lineage, in a way part of the same lineage, because the illegitimate son of the last ruler became the next king, and he founded what is now called the Nanda dynasty. So this is the Nanda empire. Okay, if you, if you see where it goes from to what it becomes, Nandas, there was actually ten of them, but one of them was very important. He, he ruled, I think it was for something like 60 years. So although there was nine others, they only ruled for a short time, short time, short time. Uh, but this one Nanda, uh, who basically made this empire, 
uh, reigned for about um, 60 years, and he was, he was the one that um, expanded it. You see, this is the Himalayas here. So all this sub-Himalayan region was brought under the control of what was previously Magadha, just a small state down here, but had now become like quite an empire. Now it's during the time of the Nandas that Alexander the Great built his empire coming out from Greece. Gre Greece is like, you know, perhaps another thousand kilometers off the side of the map. But Alexander had walked all, all the way across what was then Persia, conquering Persia, down into, you know, this, is, um, this area now is Pakistan and Afghanistan. He, he had conquered all that area and he had come down into India and he was threatening to conquer the Nanda Empire but the soldiers actually revolted and they, they said that the, he was going to cross the Ganges and enter into the Nanda Empire. He had conquered you know, a huge area all the way over from Europe to India it's a very big area, you see. And the, the soldiers had been fighting with him all the way along. But when he wanted to cross into the Nanda Empire, the soldiers actually revolted and they wouldn't go. They, they refused to go because they said the Nanda Empire was too strong for them. They had something, I forget what it is actually, but some enormous amount, like 6,000 war elephants, 80,000 troops in the Nanda Empire. 80,000 troops, you know, I can't, I can't remember the exact numbers, something like 12,000 horse. So they feared if they crossed the Ganges and tried to attack that empire, they wouldn't, they wouldn't be, you know, they would be defeated, basically. And, you know, it would entail a big loss of life. So, in fact, they turned back. And as they were going back, Alexander actually was only very young, you know, when he, when he passed away. He was only 33. He'd already conquered all this area, but as he went back, tr 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 trying to get back and consolidate the area, he got dysentery. And dysentery was a very uh, deadly disease and quite uh, quickly can kill. Uh, so he contracted dysentery and he never got back to Greece. He died in the deserts of um, South East Iran in that area. And he died at the age of 33. It's not very, not very old, really. But he brought, he brought this empire, and it became important because all these areas around here and here became settled by Greeks. And this had a big influence on uh, Buddhism later on. All of these statues that you see, they were not made in uh, Lord Buddha's time, of course. And they were not made for a few centuries afterwards. And when they were made, they were made by the Greek-influenced cultures in Gandhara. It was the Greeks who introduced the idea of uh, doing statues of the Buddha. They never had statues of the Buddha before that because the Greeks were making statues, you know, in, in Greece of uh, Apollo, and of uh, Dion Dionysius and of the goddesses and things like this. So when they came in contact with Buddhism, they also started making statues of Lord Buddha. And if you look at the Greek statues of Apollo and the Greek statues of the Buddha, you know, their features are the same. They basically carried it over from one to the other because there's no representation of the Buddha from the early period. They used to they used to represent it by symbols. They would put like an empty chair would represent Lord Buddha. They wouldn't represent, they wouldn't draw the Lord Buddha. It was not thought to be correct to, to do that. Uh, other times they would just uh, do the Bodhi tree. You'll see people grouped around and they're obviously focused on something, but there's just a tree and there's no, nothing there's nobody there, but in fact the Buddha's there, but you, they don't represent him, you see. For the first period, that's called the aniconic period of Buddhism, before they started making icons of the Lord Buddha. Uh, that went on for centuries, and it's only when it came in contact with this Greek culture that they started making 
representations of the Lord Buddha. When they made all these uh, stupas, like at Sanchi and Bahut, uh, the er early stupas that we still have, if you look on those, there's no representations of Lord Buddha, although all the stories about Lord Buddha are told, Jataka stories are told, humans are represented, animals are there, there's all, all, everything is there, but not Lord Buddha. It doesn't, it doesn't show. It's only later, under the influence of Greek culture, that you get the um, representation of the Buddha for the first time. That Alexander came in. So the Nanda Empire, consolidating this big area, went on, I think, for about maybe a hundred years or something like that. And then the next stage, after the Nandas, there were ten Nanda kings. After the Nandas, then another dynasty took over. Now, this is a really important dynasty. In the time of Lord Buddha, there was a group of people around here called the Mauryas. They were just like one of these tribes, like the Sakyas, the Malas, the Mauryas. Just a small tribe, actually, not a big tribe. But they had been absorbed into this bigger empire. And then you got the, the rise of a new dynasty coming from the Mauryan people. Okay, The first king was Chandagutta. And Chan Chandagutta managed to make an enormous expansion. Actually, not this part. From, if you cut it off here, his son added this part. But Chandagutta, by the time he was 20, he had conquered most of India. All of this area, not Kalinga, which becomes important in a minute, and not this um, Greek-influenced area here, but the rest of the area, including a lot of the south, Chandagutta, who was one of the great emperors in the Indian history, he had managed to expand it. And now there's an important thing here, because his advisor was a minister called Kautilya. Kautilya, we still have his writings, Artasrastra, it's, it's, it's like a book of political science. That book is standard in uh, Indian history. He wrote this book showing how the kings could, through various means, overcome their enemies. That means even deceitful means. He, he showed what deceitful means could be used. He showed how to use force to overcome you know, opposition and how to undermine other groups and things like this. And he was the minister who advised Chandagutta. And you see, through his advice, even by the age of 20, he had conquered most of India. His son was called Bindusara, and Bindusara managed to extend the empire by taking, this is like Afghanistan and Pakistan, you see. But in those days, it was the Ionian areas, the Greek areas. And he had, over, he had managed to take those areas and push the rulers of the Ionians back out into Iran. And he also extended it somewhat down here as well. So the, the empire, if, if you look from the beginning, you see, it just, it just starts like this, as a small place of Magadha, a Jatasattu, uh, made it that much bigger, spreading it out onto the eastern India and onto the coast. And then the Nandas spread it up into the sub-Himalayan district. And then Chandagutta and his son Bindusara uh, actually established this huge empire over most of India. Now you think about that, that's about 3,500 kilometers across there, you see. It's bigger than India is now. Yeah, and it also goes up, it's off the map, you know, here it's off the map, and then down. But these lands, you see, were the Tamil lands. This is Tamil Nadu down here. And the Tamils are always been fiercely independent, even during the Mauryan Empire and during Ahsoka's time, they were never able to conquer the Tamil lands. They are very fiercely independent and proud people, you can say. So they managed to keep their independence, this kind of southern area. 
Eventually, they all became part of India, but at this time, they were still managed to maintain their independence. And the uh, Tamils actually played a really big uh, part in the history of Theravada Buddhism uh, later because that became the heartland. Uh, Tamil Nadu, Andhra Pradesh and Sri Lanka was the heartland for the Theravada teachings. Now then, when Bindusara actually... Now, it, it's said in, in our tradition, and it's not impossible, actually. It's said that he had 101 sons. Kings in those days had large harems, you know, that they would actually, you know, they would go around turn by turn and get them all pregnant, you know, and they would, they would, have, they would have so many children. Bindusara was supposed to have 101 children. Two of those, one of them was Ahsoka, and the other was Tissa. Now Ahsoka was very, he was a very violent young man. And he was not liked. He was very powerful, even as a very young man. He was very powerful, uh, but he was not liked. And, he, and his father actually sent him out to Avanti. Avanti is around here to take charge of that vice royalty. There's like a state here. And he was put in charge of that state. Now, it's while he was in charge of that state, when he went there, on his way, he met a merchant. And then he met the merchant's daughter. So he wanted that daughter. So, in fact, I don't think for the daughter, it's really a very good fate because this, this, you know, this young tyrant, you know, she wouldn't have any say in it. You know what I mean? She's, he gave gifts to the family, actually. And so basically he bought her. But he had two children by her. Those children are Mahinda and Sangamitta. But it's not really so auspicious as, it's, as, as people think, you know, when they hear that um, Ahsoka's children were Mahinda and Sangamitta by this queen. In actual fact, when he took that queen, he was really kind of a, a pretty wild, uh, tyrannical sort of person. And when his father died, he returned immediately. He left his children and his wife, and he returned immediately to Patliputra, and he, he killed 99 of his brothers. The only one who remained alive was his own mother's other child, that's Tissa. So Tissa and Ashoka, were the, who were born from the same mother, they were the only two that survived, and he killed all the others. He was a very violent person. And after he killed them, and he, he descended to the throne, that's now 218 years after Lord Buddha's Parinibbana. So this is, this is what has happened to the political landscape in the last two centuries. It's grown from you know, a small area like this and it's you know, expanded. And there's only a few areas left that uh, are not conquered by this empire. So after Ashoka came into power, he wanted to continue the expansion of that empire, of course which is, you know, basically what all the kings want to do. They're always trying to make things... For some reason, they think if they make it bigger, they make it safer, but it doesn't really work like that, you know. There's all these border areas where you can't control it. Even if it's a small border, you can't control it. When it gets a bigger border, it gets a bigger problem. And then you get a huge, huge border. It's, you know, an enormous problem. You know, you can't protect all these borders and everything. But nevertheless, it's kind of the intrinsic logic of empire is that you're always trying to expand. So Ahsoka waged war on Kalinga. Kalinga was a group of people that was still holding out against this, you know, really massive Mauryan empire, which everything else had been unified. But Kalinga, which is now basically what we would say is the state of Orissa, so Ahsoka attacked the Kalingas in this area and it was actually a devastating war. Altogether, with the casualties in that war 
And with the famine that was caused by that war, over a hundred thousand people died. They were kind of beaten to death, you know what I mean? With hacked to death and, you know, hatchets or stomped on by elephants or, you know, left to kind of die in the streets. And after, after the war, there was no food. And the people were just dying on the streets from famine and so on and so forth. Ashoka, you know, after that war, he went into the cities. And the cities, there was dead bodies all over the cities. And when he saw that, he was really uh, disgusted by what had happened. Yeah. It's actually what brought about his, con his conversion. Seeing the destruction that he had caused and the amount of people that had died, he, he underwent like a conversion process. And out of that conversion process, he became Buddhist. So, you know, b before, it's, a, it's an interesting thing. When, when he was uh, in, in his initial stages in, in, in that empire, he was known as Chandashoka. It means violent Ashoka. Chanda means violent. And after his conversion, he decided not to conquer by force anymore. And he decided to conquer by Dharma. And then he became Dharma Ashoka. That means the righteous, the righteous Ashoka. So from the violent Ashoka to the righteous Ashoka. And one of the things that he had seen, and I think that made a big influence on him, was that also, like the holy men, the Brahmins and the Samanas had also been destroyed in this war. They had also, of course, suffered from the famines and things like that. And I think there's some kind of, um, there's something in this that he was scared of what he had done. Not only just seeing what he had done and being repulsed by it, but I think he was scared of what might come back to him. You know, teachings of Kamma uh, uh, were, were prevalent in the empire. You know, Buddhism was kind of, you know, spreading, and Jainism, which also has this teaching of karma, uh, was, was spreading. Uh, was all, all in this empire and everything like this. So these teachings of karma were known. And he, I think myself, he must have seen what he'd done and was scared of what he'd done. And he, he turned away from it in, partially in repulsion, partially in fear. Now then, I just want to take it back a bit because what we've been seeing is the expansion, the great expansion of the political landscape in India. At the same time during that 218 years before the rise of Ashoka, also what we had seen was the disintegration of the homogeneity of the Buddhist teaching. The Buddhist teaching started as just one, if you like anyway, it started as one teaching centered around the 500 Arahats who gave that uh, council it's actually just south of Pataliputra here, you see it, Rajagaha, which was the old capital. They gathered after the Lord Buddha passed away. They held the council and everything was still in unison, basically, at that time. Sometime later, the Vajians, who we mentioned earlier, they started different practices, different Vinaya practices that were unorthodox. And then they held the second council to reconcile that uh, situation. But following the second council, and before the third council, which was held in Ashoka's time, then it had started, the, the, the whole thing, there was a kind of dynamism there, whereby it had split into schools. There was these two big divisions, the Mahasangika and the Terrier. The Terrier had split off they were, if you like, from, anyway, the Theravada will tell you, they were the orthodox group. Out of the Mahasangika, which means the great Sangha, which means the majority, the majority actually developed eventually into the Mahayana. They gave, gave rise to uh, different teachings eventually from the Mahasangika. So th that was the two big groups, but then the Terriers divided, they, they divided into the uh, Vibhajavadins, into the Sarvastavadins, into the Kashyapas, 
and various different groups. Eventually, not at this time, but later on, there's traditionally said to be 18 different schools of, of the terriers. And then there were other schools that were eventually would uh, give rise to the Mahayana. So while you've got the concentration of power into one state politically, at the same time you'd seen something like a disintegration of the homogeneity of the teachings in the Sasana. So the Sasana had split up. This was an important issue because when Ashoka became a Buddhist, he, he, beca he became a Buddhist really under the influence of uh, one of the great, great leaders of the Sangha at the time, Mowgli Buddha. And then Ashoka asked Mowgli what was the correct teaching. He wanted to know because there were all these different schools around, all teaching different things. He wanted to know what was the correct teaching. And Mowgli was a Vibhajavadin. It's from the Vibhajavadins that we get now, eventually, the Theravada. So, there was two things that had happened, which was that the Sasana had split into different groups, and it had also, at the same time, become the most well-supported teaching in the empire. Because it was so well-supported, then many other people who were you know, part of the other groups, part of the other Samana groups came into the Sasana because they were getting, you know, better support, but not because they were true Buddhist or whatever, you know, but because the support was in the Buddhist Sasana and these other groups were kind of going down and getting less support. So a lot of people who'd come in were not living, you know, in a regular orthodox way. So there was these two problems. There was a lot of people in the sasana, low monastics it means, in the sasana who were not living an, an orthodox monastic life and there was this split into groups. First of all, Ashoka basically cleansed the Sangha. That means he asked the elders to decide who are, who are the real monks and nuns and who are not. And in fact, they disrobed the, the monks who were not living properly. And then they just had, you know, anyway, supposedly, anyway, they just had like the orthodox monks who were living properly. For something like seven years or something, they were not able to hold the oppositor. The oppositor is when the monks come together to recite the party mokka. Because of the divisions in the Sangha, they were, they were not able to hold it. So after, after this period of time, they managed to bring the uh, Sangha back into, into one group again, and they managed to hold the oppositor. They had expelled all the bad monks and bad nuns, and they unified, and they held the third council. And then... You see, because under the influence of Mowgli Puta, Ashoka asked Mowgli Puta, who was his preceptor, he asked him, what is the correct teaching? And Mowgli Puta said, the Vibhajavadin is the correct teaching coming down from the Lord Buddha, and Ashoka accepted that. And then they had a third council. The first council, there were 500 monks and recited the teaching. At the second council, there were 700. It's known as the Council of the 700. At the third council, there was a thousand. Of course, you know, it's growing all the time, so there's more, more monks around and everything. But it was, they, had, they got together a thousand monks, and then they recited the teachings that they decided were the orthodox teachings. Now, following that, you see Ashoka has conquered. He hasn't conquered everything. He could also go and attack the Tamils, of course. Uh, but he decided not to attack and to conquer by force, but to conquer by Dharma. So following the third council, what they did was send out missions to all the outlying areas. They sent out all these missions and you can see they're all in the border areas. That would traditionally have been the areas that he would have gone for conquest. 
It's quite interesting. Those were the areas that he would have been pushing back the boundaries if he'd have been waging a war like he was waging a war before. But now he's not waging a war. He's trying to uh, convert people to Dharma. If people convert to Dharma, they're not going to be a threat anymore. He's conquering by Dharma. Not only is he just trying to spread the religion that he believes in, he's also securing his borders. You know, He's also securing his state. Because the more homogenous you can make the state, then the, you know, the safer it is because everybody is holding the same beliefs. So this is not only just a matter of you know, like spreading the religion you know, for an, an emperor, uh, for somebody who wants to hold together their empire, this is also you know, like a strategy that can uh, accomplish that. And so I think it has those two aspects that, that it's, uh, it, it, it's serving from our point of view now looking back, you see. It's so important that these missions went out to the border areas because eventually Buddhism in this area all died off. It's because it went out to Kashmir and Gandhara, which is where traditionally the first uh, mission went, that eventually it crossed over the back of the Himalayas into China. If it hadn't have gone out into these areas in the first place, it wouldn't have been able to cross over into China. If it would have just been stayed in this little area, which is where it was during Lord Buddha's time and for quite a long time afterwards. Similarly, it went down into Sri Lanka and it went out into Suwanabumi. From Suwanabumi also down into Indonesia, you see. Okay, so the first mission went out traditionally, as it's given in the list anyway, went out to Kashmir and Gandhara with Majantika. And Majantika was actually Mahinda's preceptor. And he led the mission out to Kashmir and Gandhara. This is also quite interesting, I think, because when they went out into these border areas, it wasn't simply a matter of teaching. In some cases it was. In some cases, they just went out and gave teachings and the people converted. But in some cases, it wasn't like that. Like, for instance, when Majantika went to Kashmir Gandhara, which was quite a wild area, he first had to overcome the local gods and show that his power was greater than the power of the Nagas and the Yakas who were ruling the land you know, and that the people were praying to and under the kind of sovereignty of, if you like. So he had to show through his own supernatural powers, his own iddy powers, that he was able to overcome these gods. And that's exactly what he did. There, there was one, I think he's called Aravala, uh, one of the Nagas uh, who was in a lake. And Majantika went and he walked up and down on the lake, you know, like uh, just taking control of it, you know. He also stood in the air and uh, showed that he had more power than these local gods. It was an important precursor to giving the teachings. Once they had accepted that his power was greater, that his actual psychic power, if you like, his spiritual power was greater than, than the gods' power that they had been worshipping, it was only at that point that he actually started teaching. But when he gave the Dhamma teaching, there was a big conversion. It was a display of magical power, or psychic power, or spiritual power, followed by a display of the other miracle, which is the, it's called the, the miracle of the teaching. Yeah. There's the miracle of psychic powers, and there's the miracle of the teaching. So it was the miracle of the teaching that actually worked for the conversion of the people. And then the people converted and then they accepted the teaching. So many people ordained. They went out, not just... Majantika was the leader of the, uh, of the mission. He didn't go by himself, you know, just one, just one monk go, 
But sometimes people think like that. They think just one monk went. And then they say, how could he ordain people? He can't ordain people. He's only one monk. But he wouldn't go just by himself, you know. He would take a group with him. In fact, in some of the texts, it actually tells that um, he, they took monks with them, you know. The next mission that was mentioned is down to Mahisa Mandala by Mahadeva. Another one to Vanavasi, which was uh, Rakita. And then to Aparantika. This was known as a very violent area. There's stories in the, um, in the Tripitaka about the people in this area. All of this was uh, like jungle area and everything, you know. The, the people were living quite in difficult circumstances, you know. And they were hunting and, you know, banding together in groups and things and having to protect themselves and warlords in the area and all this sort of thing. You know, it's, it's not like a, like now a civil state. You know, especially on the border areas, it wasn't it wasn't like that. You know, the border areas were always known uh, for the uh, amount of violence that there was there. Anyway, Damarakita went up to Aparantika, and he he converted this area. Now, there's one interesting thing here, which is that it it says the traditions that have come down to us that a thousand men became monks after this conversion by Damarakita, but even more women became nuns. And it's one of the, you know, it's one of the characteristics of these early missions that so many nuns and so many uh, women converts were mentioned. You, you know, basically because of history and her story, history forgets her. She's always written out of history. That's, that's, that's actually the case, of course. But in, in Buddhist history, even there was some of that as, as well, because the early histories, uh, the, the very first history seems to be Deepawamsa. And Deepawamsa was almost certainly written by the nuns in Sri Lanka. And it records the nuns' lineage, and it records all the conversions, it records all the nuns' vinaya teachers, which nuns were good at uh, teaching Abhidhamma, and all like this, you know. That was eventually, it was a bit of a mess as a literary work, all different traditions kind of not quite brought together into a whole. That was eventually written into Mahawamsa, which is now the standard history. And in the Mahawamsa, nearly all these nuns are taken out. It's history. That's, that's what's happening in history, you see. The women are taken out of history. But in these early traditions, we still, we still know, I mean, how many women became nuns, how many of those nuns became arahats, their lineages, their traditions and everything like this, you know, it's all been passed down. So some of these other missions went out. One, one of these missions was up to the Himalaya. It says Majima and four other elders. They converted all these countries. An enormous amount of um, people became monastics, and also converts to the religion. Also, very important for the Burmese and the Thai traditions, because the other mission that went out was to Suwanabumi. Now, I must tell you that although people believe that this is the area where Suwanabumi is, Burmese believe it was in Burma, and the Thais believe it was in Thailand, but in actual fact, it may not have been in either. It, it's actually possible it was in India because we, we have no evidence for it going out this far at that time. There's certainly no archaeological evidence. But traditionally, the Thais and the Burmese will tell you it came to my country. And it isn't impossible, of course. It's not at all impossible that the, that the mission went out here because there were trade routes out here. They used to come down from Patlipu to down the Ganges to what is now Calcutta, Tarmaliti in those days, and they would come down, we'll see in a minute, and they would go down. Following the monsoon, the monsoon rains push you around here and you can get to do your trading in what, it, what was then the Mon country. All of this was Mon, not Burmese. The Burmese didn't come in for another... 1,500 years. The Burmese come in off the Tibetan plains. So did the, the Thais come down from Yunnan. 
they were not in this area. This was all Mon. So even if this is where Suwanabumi is, there were no Burmese there and there were no Thais there. So they might as well forget it anyway because they were still up in the... Uh, up in the Tibetan plains and up in actual fact the Thais appear to have come down from Mongolia and done a large mo migration over, over China down into Yunnan and eventually pushed out you know still a lot of people in Yunnan are Thai uh, tradition and the rest have come down those valleys into uh, Thailand and then they've pushed on the one side they pushed the Khmer back who are now the Cambodians, and on the other side, they pushed the Mon back, who are now like a small part of Burma. But all this area was Mon, and this area, which is off the map a bit, was Khmer in those, in those days, the Khmer of a very ancient history. Anyway, they went out to Suwanabumi. This is also important because of all the arguments that we get now. It says 3,500 men became monks and 1,500 became nuns. That's also important now because if you ask the Thais, they'll say, there was never any nuns in Thailand. The Burmese will tell you the same. There was never any uh, nuns in, in Burma. But in actual fact, from the earliest history, if they want to claim Suwanabumi was in their country, they have to accept that there were nuns in their country as well. Then the other important mission, of course, was the mission down to Sri Lanka. Because basically now the Theravada uh, comes to us through Sri Lanka eventually. Mahinda, when they shaved his head in the ordination hall, at that point he became Arahat. When they shaved Sangamitta's head, she didn't become Arahat at that time. Uh, she was only 18 at the time. She was already a mother, by the way. Uh, she'd given birth to a young boy, I suppose, called Sumana. And Sumana later actually was part of the mission to Sri Lanka. He was only a Samanera, because he was still, still so young. But he, he was part of the mission. And he had become an Arahat. And he could uh, fly through the air and... But he had all these psychic powers. He was well known for his psychic powers. In fact, even when they gave the first Dhamma teaching, they asked Sumana to announce it. And when he announced it, they could hear it over the whole of Sri Lanka. Mahinda first went back to Avanti, actually, and he spent a year in Avanti with his mother. Mahinda left Avanti. He went back to Pataliputta, and he actually flew through the air, and he landed in... Mahintali, what we now call Mahintali. Mahintali means Mahinda's plain. So he landed on the top of Misika Pabata mountain. This was Anuradhapura at the time of Devanampiyatissa. He was um, subject to King Ashoka. That means he was giving tribute to King Ashoka. He wasn't formally part of the empire, uh, but Sri Lanka was a tributary state to this large empire in, in India. So even at Ashoka's coronation, then Devanampiyatissu, who was the king of Sri Lanka, sent tribute to him. So afterwards, then uh, Ashoka sent missionaries in return. You see, he sent tribute and he sent missionaries out to uh, Sri Lanka. So they landed on this mountain. This was Anuradhapura. This is basically the city area here. And the king had gone out on a hunting trip. He said he went out with 40,000 of his men, which is quite, you know, quite a big troop of men to go hunting, you know. But the deva of the mountain wanted to attract Deva Nampiatis' attention. So he, he transformed himself into a deer and he just stayed out of range. So the king would follow him. And eventually the king got separated from his group. And then once he had come into the uh, area where Mahinda was, Mahinda showed himself. And the king was very surprised. You know, he didn't expect. And Mahinda called him by name. Nobody speaks the king's name. You're not allowed to speak the king's name. And he just said, Tissa, come here. 
like this, you know. So, so for, for one thing, you know, you're not supposed to speak to the king by his personal name, you know. For another thing, how does he know his name? You see, he doesn't know how he knows, knows his name. And then they had this kind of discussion. There's kind of a very strange dialogue that takes place. I can't exactly explain, explain it to you. And it's very involved uh, kind of wisdom riddles that were, being, that were being exchanged between these two people. And then really what happened was that uh, Mahinda understood that Devanam Pietisa was a very wise man. And Devanam Pietisa understood that Mahinda was a very wise man. And then Mahinda also gave a teaching to the king. So the teaching was, they, they say traditionally, it was the uh, Chulahati Badopadma uh, Sutta. It's now found in Majimnikai. So he gave that teaching and the king was convinced. Mahinda also showed the other people who had come with him. He had hidden, him, he had hidden them for, by his psychic power. But then he showed them and then uh, invited them to come back. So they came back over to Anuradhapura. And they were in, in this area, this is the Nandavana. They were in this area and they were giving their teachings and everything. Now also a very important thing you see, because one of the persons who heard the teachings that they were given was Queen Anula. Queen Anula was Devanam Pietisa's brother's queen. So he was like a, prince, a vice regent or whatever. So she heard the teaching and also 500 other uh, women in the harem heard the teaching and they attained Sotapanna. Then they became but the first ones who had attained to any stage of holiness and they heard some more teaching from Mahinda and they became uh, Sakadagami. That's at the second path. When they attained to Sakadagami, they asked the king if they could ordain. They asked the king if they could ordain. And the king asked Mahinda, can you ordain them? And Mahinda said, I can't ordain them because uh, it needs nuns also to ordain them. He said, but my sister Sangamitta is living back in India and she can come down with the quorum of nuns and they can give the ordination. So Devanam Pietisa uh, sent back to India uh, on the reverse, you know, the reverse trip. You have to wait for the trade winds. You can't just go when you want. But when the winds were going in the right direction, he sent one of his ministers, Aritta, and group of people back to Pataliputra to ask Ashoka to send two things, which was the Arahat Sangamitta and quorum of nuns and the Bodhi tree, what we now call the Maha Bodhi tree. That was a branch of the tree under which Lord Buddha had attained awakening. These two things were sent back to Sri Lanka. And when, when they came down, they, they sailed down. There was 12 nuns. There's this other group of people who had gone, Aritta and his group, and they brought the Bodhi tree. First of all, before, before he sent it actually, Ahsoka installed the Bodhi tree as uh, emperor of the empire for a week. I think he did it in Patliputra and then when they got to the coast, before he sent it off. And then he said, when you get back to Sri Lanka, you tell the king he also must give it sovereignty over, over Sri Lanka. I have crowned this tree as sovereign of the whole of the Mauryan Empire. When you get it to Sri Lanka, it must also be made uh, sovereign over the whole of Sri Lanka. So they sent it down. They say on the way that the, uh, the Nagas came out to the waters. You know, the Nagas live in the waters. So the Nagas came out to the waters and then they wanted to um, worship the uh, tree for a week. So after a big discussion with uh, the Arahat Sangamita, they took it down to the Nagalands 
and then they worshipped the tree for a week and then they put it back on board and then it continued down to Sri Lanka. Same thing, it landed at uh, probably what is Nagadipa or Jaffna Peninsula and came down to Anuradhapura. And the king did, uh, you know, King Devan and Pietas did uh, install it as the Lord Sovereign of the whole of Sri Lanka. Uh, but eventually he brought it down wherever the road might have been. He brought it down from the Jaffna Peninsula and then he planted it in the, it's actually in the Ma Megavanna, which is, it was, you see, this is the city area here. The first place that the monks had gone to was Nandavanna, but they had, they had kind of said to the uh, king, it's too close to the city and not comfortable for monks to be too close to the city. So he had given this land, which was Megavanna, it means the Great Cloud Monastery. He gave him this, you know, it means like a, like a whole forest area. He'd given this whole forest area to the monks. That's where they'd spent the first range retreat. So the first range retreat, you see, and that's where the Marbodi was eventually planted. When you go to the Marbodi tree in Sri Lanka now, that's the area where Mahinda spent the first range retreat and it's where the Mahavihara was. The Mahavihara was the centre of, um, or became, the centre of Theravada orthodoxy. That's where all the commentaries, all the great commentaries were written and everything like that. And eventually, this Mahavihara won out against the Abhayagiri and against the Jaitavana and all this, and they became the sole orthodoxy in Sri Lanka. In, in those days, there was only the Mahavihara. That was Mahinda's uh, monastery, the first monastery that was built. You see, now these areas in blue that I've marked in blue, these were the areas that were built by the king in the first year of the introduction of Buddhism in Sri Lanka. It's really quite remarkable. He, he built the Mahavihara, which was the big monastery for the for the monks, there was, I, I think, a thousand or five hundred nobles, sons of noble families, uh, converted and became monks. And he built the Isara Samana, it means the noble ascetics monastery. There was a, a lot of um, farmers also converted and became monks. And he built the Vesagiri, that means the farmers' mountains monastery. Built the Dakina Vihara, Dakina means southern. So this is the southern monastery here. This was where they put up the Nivata Chaitya because at one time Mahinda was leaving from Nandavana. He didn't want to live so near to the city. Uh, he was living, leaving from Nandavana and going back out towards the Misikapabata, which is actually where he spent uh, most of his time. And when he got this far, the king caught up with him. And he asked him to turn round and he said, I'll give you this land down here and see if this is comfortable. That's where they put up the Nivata Chaitya. It means the turning shrine, the place where Mahinda turned round and came back into nearer area. And that's eventually what became the Mahamega Vana. Now, the other thing that they, they built, but I can't show it on the map because it's, we don't know where it was. All we know was that it was in the city areas. Some, it's probably around the centre. But when they sent that um, group off to India, the nuns, that, that means a thousand nuns, interestingly, they all put on brown robes. They were not ordained, but they all put on brown robes, or yellow robes, if you like, just like Mahapajapati did yeah, when she was in... Kapilavastu. She, she was in Kapilavastu and then she walked down to uh, Vaisali to ask the Buddha if she could ordain with a thousand followers. And they, they were all uh, dressed in uh, brown robes before their ordination. Same thing with Anula and her followers. Uh, they actually put up in a nunnery. Because they were lay people at that time, that became known as the Upasika Vihara. It means the laywomen's Vihara. Uh, but it actually became the nunnery. 
When Sangha Mitta came down, they started doing the ordinations, and so those thousand women became ordained in that uh, nunnery. And then, because it was in the center of the city, it, it says that Sangha Mitta was not so uh, comfortable because it was too crowded and everything like that. Like the monks were outside the city, but the nuns are not quite allowed to do this because there had been rape cases. If you remember, Upalavana was uh, raped. And then the Lord Buddha Salt told that the nuns mustn't live alone in the forest. They must live in kind of more safe areas because of this situation. So when they had the nunnery, it was in the city. But there was another area which was on the edge of the city, which was quiet. And um, it's actually where the one of the state elephants used to graze. So the people used to go out to that area and they used to feed that elephant. And they built a stupa there as well. And then uh, Sangamitta went out there one day and she found that that was a nice area. And so they built a new monastery. That was called the Hatalika Upasya. That means the elephants measures nunnery. And Upasya is a nunnery in Pali. Because that's, that's where they used to give the elephant a measure of rice. Uh, they used to go out there and feed him. It was like, you know, like, you know, something to do on a Sunday or whatever, you know. Go out and feed the elephant. So they built that nunnery. Now we think it's probably in this area, but there's no remains of it. But it, it says, you see, nearby they built the Mahapali. And we know where the Mahapali is. So it's probably in this area. The Mahapali was where it was a big hall where they could feed the nuns and they could feed the monks. Because there's a lot of monks and there's a lot of nuns to feed now. You know, you've got a thousand nuns even at the very beginning. And you've got uh, more, more monks are ordained as well there. So they have to be able to feel them. Okay, so that was the, the, the mission to Sri Lanka. From there, the kind of... Um, you know, in later centuries, became, as I said, the heart of the Theravada orthodoxy. But that's how the missions developed. So if we, if we just go back through, it was just a small state, and then it became a bigger state. It became something like an empire, eventually covered nearly the whole of India, and then uh, even more so during Ashoka's time. And then Ashoka sent out these missions. Actually, in his 13th edict, you know, which is written in stone, we can still read it. His 13th edict, it says that he actually sent out missions to Alexandria. Ale Alexandria is out in Egypt and also to Athens. It's right into Europe. So the Buddhist missions went right into Europe in Ashoka's time. But in our texts, that means in Mawamsa and Deepawamsa and so on like that, they mentioned that it got, they went out to the Ionians, that means the Greeks. So we, we believe it means this area. Uh, but in the edicts, it actually says specifically to Alexandra, that means into Egypt. He is the absolute paradigm for Buddhist kingship. What a truly righteous Buddhist king should be is what Ashoka was, you know. He built hospitals, he protected animals, he made his own kitchens vegetarian, he built infrastructure throughout his empire, he sent out missions to convert the rough peoples on the edge of the empire, he even uh, did things like cleanse the Sangha, so the Sangha was, uh, you know, not corrupt anymore. He held the council so the, so the teachings were being properly preserved. He built 84,000 monasteries and he put relics in all those monasteries. You know, remember last time I told you where the relics were after the Parinibbana. So it, 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 they tell that Ashoka went to those relic houses and then he opened them up. And he got the relics out, and then he's, he, you know, he spread them throughout the empire. They're also they're representatives of the imperial power. If, the, if King Ashoka has built the temple and the stupa, and he's put that relic there, it's somehow 
establishes his authority. So he asked Mowgli Pudatissa, how many dhammas are there? So Mowgli just said, there's 84,000 dhammas. So he built 84,000 uh, stupas and put the relics in all those stupas. So you see, he became a model for the uh, Buddhist kingship. That's one thing. And the, the other thing, the other important thing about Ashoka is, which is what we'll see next time, is because he sent out these missions, then that's why we received the Dhamma today. With, without Ashoka, if it had remained a regional, local religion, which is what it was up until his time, it would have died out in the Middle Ages with the Muslim invasions, you know, which is what happened to it in India. You know, it would have just died and that would have been the end of it and we wouldn't be sat here as Buddhists today. The root, of course, is the Buddha giving the teaching, but, but the second most important person in Buddhist history is Ashoka because Ashoka sent out these missions to uh, the outlying areas and it's those outlying areas uh, that, that the uh, religion survived in when it collapsed and uh, you know became non-existent in the center so everybody say sadhu